some of the general things that we will be seeing and have been seeing, um, slime molds have been pretty common this year. We had a photograph sent in of this fuzzy looking thing that looked like it crawled out from under the siding on someone's, uh, could have been a porch, and we identified that as a steminitis, which is a slime mold that's associated with wood. It doesn't decay the wood, but it likes decaying wood. So if you see that on any kind of um, structure, then you should investigate and see if you don't have a water problem there in your wood. So that's what's pictured down at the bottom there. And on the left, there's a fruiting of Ficerum. This is an image sample, I think actually came in earlier, maybe in May, but uh, fruiting all over some clover that was next to a, a field and people were concerned that it might be getting into that field. But these are actually harmless. And probably the most common one you'll see is the Fuligo septica, which I've shown pictures of before, the so-called dog vomit slime mold. And there was a big patch of that on a mulch bed next to the highway exit or entrance ramp that I that I use often but um, being in a moving car with traffic I wasn't able to get any picture of it ever. We're seeing mushrooms pop up and we even got a email inquiry about stinkhorns. A little surprising to me this time of year but those may be another fun fungal nuisance that people may actually com be complaining about. And of course, sooty mold, which you see on the far right there in the photograph, where the thumb test is what you want to use. If that layer, it may not be as thick as it is on this holly leaf, but if that layer just kind of sheds as you rub it, then you've got sooty mold, which is a fungus developing on the honeydew from insects feeding either higher up on that plant or on an overstory tree. Moving then into some things to look out for on our trees and shrubs. Well, July is a big month for a lot of different plant diseases. So I'm gonna be very selective here in what I present. But the heat of the summer, there are a couple of things that will just be getting started that we haven't seen up until this time or seen very little of. And one is the bacterial leaf scorch. There's a photograph of it there on the right. And that will only start appearing in the very heat of the summer, even though the tree has been infected uh, all year, probably been infected for many years, but the symptoms don't really start with that scorched appearance around the margins of the leaves and often kind of a, a multi-toned irregular border to it as it fades into the green healthy looking tissue at the center. We see this on uh, pin oak, you can see other oaks in the red oak group be affected sycamores, and uh, even you may see it on red buds. There's a version of this called Pierce's disease, which occurs on grape. Also on our hardwood trees, especially white oak, you may see a flow of a fermented smelling, frothy, or just liquidy efflux that is known as slime flux. This is, comes from a condition known as wet wood from a bacterial infection inside the wood itself. And the fermentation process there forces it out through the cracks in the bark, often attracts different kinds of insects to, to feed on that slime or to visit other insects that are on the slime. And um, it is not harmful to the tree. Some trees will flux one year and then not another. So there is really no remedy that should be taken there, unless there's some very, very loose bark that you just want to remove. But other than that, don't try and drill pipes into the tree and, and that sort of thing. Phytophthora root rot and armillaria root rot are two that we want to always be aware that could happen. Not necessarily the infection occurred this month, but when the heat really builds in, then the plant is stressed. And if it's got a compromised root system, unable to provide the water that it needs, then you can see the collapse. And I mentioned that armillaria root rot, especially on the rose, because that's the host we most often see it on. And um, our niece actually had one a rose bush die of this just a couple of weeks ago in her yard, and uh, uh, so we gave her a little uh, a little free advice about our malaria, but, but that's okay. She's a nurse, and she gives us a lot of free medical advice. Other things on rose uh, black spot, of course, on susceptible cultivars. But I also want to mention another disease that can look like black spot, which is Cercospora leaf spot, or Actually, the fungus is now called Passolora. 
And the difference there is the spot is not going to be as dark. It's going to be kind of a brown color and it's going to have a much more regular defined edge. Whereas with black spot, you get more of a feathery look to the edge. And I've, I've shown pictures of that in the past. But both of them can cause not only the spotting, but the yellowing, the chlorosis, and defoliation of the leaves. And this uh, hot weather coming up is really going to be great for the, the Cercospora leaf spot, whereas black spot, of course, we've been seeing ever since the leaves came out in the rose bushes. And don't forget rose rosette. I'm not sure how much new symptoms will be showing up, but I've seen a lot of that out in the landscape this year. All right, in the, uh, the area of our fruit trees, again, having to be very selective here, just highlight a few things. We will continue to see the development of cedar apple rust on the leaves of apple. Generally doesn't have fruit infections, although I believe it can have some. The other rust diseases may be a little bit more prone to that. But also, start as we start seeing fruit develop, we may be getting both black rot and bitter rot developing, and a disease called frog eye leaf spot. And that's pictured in the lower right here, whereas you've got rust in the upper right. That is, uh, the frog eye leaf spot is interesting because it's caused by the very same pathogen, the fungus known as Botrysphaeria obtusa, that causes the black rot on the fruit. And you'll see what start out as small purple spots, and then enlarge, they turn kind of a, uh, brown or tan color there with a, a purple margin and they have a darker spot in the middle giving it a the appearance of an eye so frog eye that's that's where the name comes from of course i i should have added here too that as fruits start developing on apple if you're not on a spray program you're going to certainly see the uh the fly speck and the sooty mold developing on the cuticle of the fruit it's not a uh Serious problem, but it's a, it's a cosmetic problem that, that we'll get in the home orchards. Um, on bunch grape, two things to be on the lookout for will be black rot on the fruit. It's interesting that the problem with black rot on bunch grape is on the fruit, whereas with muscadines, it's a leaf spot disease. And downy mildew will be moving in. I'll be saying a couple things about other crops with, uh, with potential downy mildew problems as well. Maybe toward the end of the month, we'll start seeing the, uh, the Pierce's disease coming in on, on grape as well. And the same two that we mentioned in, in, uh, for June in our May program on peach would be scab. And as the fruit is expanding now on the peaches, the scab infections, since they don't expand, will often cause the fruit to crack. And brown rot, as the fruit ripens, then it gets this, uh, this very soft, fast moving decay and um, and eventually develops a fuzzy coating of the the spoilation of the fungus and develops or becomes a mummy the fruit becomes a mummy which is a um, it's another other symptom as far as our flowers i just picked two to talk about here one being peony and mentioned two diseases on each leaf spot or I'm sorry, leaf blotch, also known as measles, is a fungal disease that's important on peony. And you can see an example there on the upper right. That's kind of the more blotchy look, but um, I've also seen it, for example, on, on stems with a small red sort of, of spotting or flecking. And then the unmistakable, actually kind of attractive looking ring spot on peony, which is caused by a virus known as tobacco rattle virus. So you see those wavy line patterns and ring spots <clears throat> are typical of that virus. You could also see this on dicentra and one or two other types of perennials. On our black-eyed Susan, the Rudbeckia, a couple of leaf spots that will be on the lookout will be on the lookout for will be the very very common and widespread septoria leaf spot, which is there indicated on the arrow. It will sometimes have more of a kind of a smaller type purplish spot than the one shown here. Very hard to find the actual fungus on it though. The fruiting bodies are extremely small. And um, you'll see, a lot. If, you, if you want to see some of it, just come out here to between our building and the free expression tunnel on campus here. And there's, there's quite a bit of it on the planting of Rebecca is there. 
less common uh, is going to be downy mildew, which you see on the left there. And the, uh, the way to tell the difference is, of course, the sporulation, although the downy mildew would tend to have a, a sort of a larger dead blotch to it than the, than the septoria usually does. Although, of course, they all start out small, right? In the vegetable garden, pretty much anything that can go wrong in the vegetable garden is possible in the month of July. We now, as of a few weeks ago, don't remember the exact date, have reported uh, reports of downy mildew in North Carolina. I believe it's Wayne and Johnson counties are, are so far reported. So that's gonna be something to keep an eye out for on cucumber. It's fairly easy to recognize because of the angular chlorotic spots, yellow spots on the leaves. You may see the faint bluish gray sporulation on the underside in humid weather. On things like squash, the symptoms are a little bit less distinct, but uh, it's something you definitely want to be watching out for on your cucurbits. And the other diseases that we mentioned in June would, would apply here as well. As far as tomato, we've talked about tomato spotted wilt virus on leaves, and now as we see the fruit ripening, we may be seeing some nice yellow wing spots and, and um, or as a symptom of infection by tomato spotted wilt virus, which is spread by very small insect thrips. Other leaf spots that you can see on tomato would be bacterial leaf spot, and septoria leaf spot is probably going to be very common moving up from the lower foliage. Uh, higher and higher on the plant. And if the whole plant wilts, then you want to look for things like bacterial wilts, southern blight, which would be a decay of the base of the main stem, and uh, root knot nematode in the, in the soil. Also, if you see the lower leaves of tomatoes showing a uh, chlorosis, a yellowing in between the veins, that's very often a sign of magnesium deficiency in that particular plant. And there was a call for on the uh, plant pathology portal. If I can navigate to my link here and post it in the chat box. But um, there was a, sort of an alert posted that people should be watching for late blight, both on tomato and potato. And let's see here. Sorry about my slowness here. I apologize for that. Okay, there in the chat box is a link to that particular post. Um, it's not usually till later in the summer that we would see late blight on tomato. Potato can be earlier but it's something definitely you want to be on the, on the lookout for. Um, all right, I will take a moment here. I see that some chats have come in on the septoria on the rudbeckia. Will it eventually turn the entire plant black? I have not seen that. I've seen leaves get fairly purple from the, just a number of, of leaf spots that they have, but turning the entire plant black or having it wilt or die, that, that would be something else. Uh, now, Gene Fox reports already three or four cases of bacterial wilt this season, and um, he did a bacterial streaming exercise for EMGVs last week. Uh, do be aware that, that bacterial streaming, um, it takes a lot of bacteria to be able to see it with the naked eye there on the, on the glass of water, the beaker test. So you can sometimes have it. And what I'm saying is if you don't see it, don't necessarily rule out that you may have um, bacterial wilt, especially for things that aren't tomatoes or, or tobacco. Streaming is very heavy in those two, but in something like pepper, it's going to be less obvious. Uh, okay. What is the best method to address magnesium deficiency? A um, little bit out of my area here, but I think it's safe to say that uh, having your soil test done and 
Also, uh, I would think that using dolomitic lime, which contains uh, magnesium as well as calcium, would be would be a way to go when you're doing your liming according to your soil test recommendations. Now, lastly, on the vegetable herb garden here, we're going to be, of course, in our season four downy mildew on basil. You see the the uh, leaves getting all yellowing and blotchy, and again, that sporulation, kind of a, a grayish color, misty looking on the undersides. Um, I remember talking a couple of years ago to a farmer's market uh, provider here who said that they don't even sell basil after July 4th just because uh, the downy mildew is, is such a problem. And finally, the, the area that I know the least about turf grasses, but uh, I got the bolo list from, from Lee Butler and some of the ones that he has on that to keep out keep an eye out for on July. Our fairy ring, which can occur on any turf, and of course with the rains that we've been having, you may see the mushrooms or puffballs coming up as well as the rings of either green or dead grass tissue. Um, it's the, the season for brown patch now on tall fescue and ryegrass, this hot weather that's, that's stressing these cool season grasses. Uh, gray leaf spot too, which has been an increasing problem in recent years. That's the picture in the lower right. And those spots can eventually girdle the, so to speak, the leaf, and then it dies from that point forward. It can lead to a more, a more blighted look, which could even be confused for Pythium blight, which is the one that's shown on the lower left here. So that is about the, uh, the amount of time we have. We want to make sure to leave uh, time for Joe and Cole to talk about this serious problem that we've been having with herbicide injury. So let me stop sharing my screen and introduce Dr. Joe Neal. Many of you know from his previous appearances on plants, pests, and pathogens, is a professor of weed science in the Department of Horticulture Science. He has more than 35 years of experience working on weed management and nursery crops and landscape plantings. And this time he has been involved in herbicide injury diagnosis in urban landscapes, including recent instances of herbicide contaminated compost. Joe will discuss these recent instances and what one might advise gardeners caught in this unfortunate situation. But we'll be leading off the program here, or this, this part of it, with Cole Smith, who is a PhD student under Dr. Katie Jennings, who is the vegetable and small fruit weed management specialist. And Cole's research focuses on evaluating new herbicides for use in vegetable crops. So I will turn it over to Cole. Can you hear me, Mike? I can. I'm using my phone or my camera's microphone, so. All right. Yeah, so like Mike said, um, a lot of the off-target issues we see with herbicide and vegetable and, and bedding plants is with um, this one group of herbicides, synthetic auxins. Um, so not to get too deep into the biology, but in normal plant growth, you have cell expansion and cell division. And those two things balance each other out um, and you get normal growth. What these herbicides do is they, they cause um, over cell expansion, too much cell expansion without, the, um, without cell division. And so you end up with this situation where the plant basically grows itself to death. And so what you'll see as I go through um, pictures and as Joe goes through pictures is plants with cupped or crinkled leaves. You also see expanded or elongated stems. Um, and that's very typical of this group of herbicides. So these herbicides can further be broken down into two groups um, based off the active ingredient, if it's a residual herbicide or if it's a non-residual herbicide. So residual herbicides, what that means is that um, they create a barrier on top of the soil. You apply them to the soil and they prevent weeds from emerging through that barrier. 
And so by their nature, they stick around in the environment for a longer period of time. Um, herbicides without residuals, so they, you apply those to weeds that have already emerged and will control those weeds. And they do not stick around in the environment for quite as long. Um, but so all auxins, kind of the, um, the um, thing they all have in common is that grasses are relatively tolerant to them and they do a very good job of controlling broadleaf weeds. And so the situations where you see these being grown are in pastures um, to control um, weeds that would be toxic to livestock or you'll see them applied in turf or lawn settings to control um, weeds like clover, dandelion, and such. Um, and you can see there's a list of herbicides here. I won't read them out, but this is not an exhaustive list, um, but this is what we, we commonly see being used. So how did they get on my porch then? So here, these pictures I took in Raleigh, um, my friend's porch, they had some tomato plants um, that started showing these really interesting symptoms. And to me, these are classic auxin symptoms. Um, but we couldn't figure out where this herbicide was actually applied. Um, they hadn't applied it in their yard and they were not near any pastures or anything. So um, we'll talk a little bit about how these herbicides move off target um, and onto sensitive plants. So how the herbicides move is, is often has to do with whether it's a residual or a non-residual herbicide. With non-residual herbicides, um, we see two types of movement. Um, the first is physical drift, and this is kind of the obvious one where either a tractor is spraying or someone with a backpack is spraying, and the wind will blow those droplets onto a sensitive area and you get injury. The other type is volatilization, which is a little more complicated. So this would be after the tractor has left the field or the person has left the area. Um, it can be days later, um, if that soil or the grass heats up, the herbicide can vaporize or volatilize off of the surface and go into the atmosphere and then be deposited onto a sensitive area. Um, so this would be sort of like if, you, if you've ever seen spilt gasoline on a, on a carport or something, um, it'll volatilize off so much so that you could even light the, um, the gas off of that. It's the same concept except for it's with a pesticide. So how do you identify physical drift? So the first thing to do is look for gradients of injury. And what this means is closer to the area that was sprayed, you'll see more severe injury. And as you move away from that area, you'll see less injury. Um, also, multiple species in the area will have symptoms. Um, this would um, be different than like a virus or um, uh, calcium deficiency or something. Um, symptomatic plants will be relatively close to the source of the herbicide. And by close, I mean usually within visual distance. Physical drift usually doesn't happen over um, too extended of a period or too extended of a distance. Also, the injury is usually transient um, and plants will usually grow out of the injury. Um, the top right picture is here is a grapevine that we saw had 2,4-D injury or 2,4-D drift. And then below that was sweet potato with 2,4-D uh, injury. So moving on to vapor drift, it can be a little more tricky. Um, Depending on the source, there may not be a gradient. So I've seen out in the Mississippi Delta um, entire fields of soybean that had been injured due to vapor drift. And it, they would be uniform across tens of, sometimes hundreds of acres of soybeans. Um, and multiple species in the area will be affected similar to physical drift. Um, symptomatic plants could be near to the sprayed area or they could be the next county over. Um, and so it's important to differentiate between physical and vapor drift because you don't want to blame your neighbor if it came from the other, from the next county over. Um, and again, injury is transient, similar to physical injury. So most plants will grow out of this um, injury. The top right picture here is a, was a, from a blackberry field in Arkansas. Um, and it had very clear auxin symptoms 
Um, but there was no, they could not identify anywhere in the area that had sprayed herbicide. And so their conclusion was this was vapor drift um, that had been caught up in the atmosphere and traveled a long distance. Um, below that is a red maple that uh, Joe Neal um, took a picture of. It was on a nursery where um, there was a pasture a couple miles away where they had sprayed a 2,4-D product um, and it had injured um, plants in this nursery. So off-target movement of residual herbicides can be even more complicated. And this is kind of the, the reason uh, me and Joe were asked to talk today. So because residual herbicides can stick around in the environment for a longer period of time, they can end up being passed along in the, I guess you could call it the supply chain. So if these herbicides are applied on a pasture or a hayfield or a lawn, um, the herbicide will stick around on that grass. So if you have, if you cut the grass and you collect those clippings and then you place those clippings around a vegetable garden, the herbicide can leach off of the grass and into the soil and be taken up by the vegetables that are sensitive and you can get injury. Similarly, um, if livestock eat the grass that has been um, treated, the herbicides will pass through their digestive system it does not harm them and that's it's perfectly legal to do because it has they have very low mammalian toxicity um, but it can get concentrated in their manure and then if that manure is removed from the field and placed around a vegetable garden or bedding plants you can see injury now according to the labels the products that are prone to do this you're not supposed to remove the manure or the hay from the field unless it's going onto a non-sensitive crop like other pastures or wheat or corn. Um, but on, um, with large operations and stuff, mistakes can be made and this can enter into compost and be sold. Um, and that's kind of the issue we've been seeing in North Carolina. Joe will talk a little more about that. But when looking at this injury, um, there will not be a gradient of injury because the the injury will only be around the plants that you put um, the manure or the grass clippings around. So if you want to tell us apart from um, drift, look outside of the area where you have placed compost, look in, um, in the bushes, in the, in the drainage ditch or other areas. Look for broadleaf weeds that um, see if they have injury or not. Only plants exposed to the grass clippings or the manure will be affected. Also, the injury will not be transient or often isn't. Um, and that's because the herbicide that leaches out of the manure or the grass clippings and enters the soil and will continue damaging those roots. It doesn't break down very quickly. So to go in a little more in depth, um, herbicides and grass clippings, um, so these herbicides can persist over eight weeks in grass clippings. So if you contaminate a flower bed or a vegetable garden, um, your season may be over, your growing season may be over unless you want to replace um, that. But Joe will talk a little bit more about remediation. The kind of the most important thing here is prevention. So if you, um, if you apply a herbicide to your lawn, don't use those grass clippings, just leave them where they are um, it's good to let those break down and, and feed those nutrients back to your lawn anyway. Um, and then the herbicide will stay where it's supposed to be. Um, and with that, I'll let Joe talk a little bit more about his experiences um, and what you can do if you do have contamination. Yes. Um uh, if you could uh, unshare your screen, I can go ahead and share mine. There we go. All right. Okay, so everybody seeing uh, my shared screen? You got it. Great. Okay, so. Well, really, uh, uh, 
brought this to a uh, head recently uh, or brought this to the forefront recently is some, um, you know, we, we look at, as Cole was showing there, you know, the herbicide can come into landscape beds and, and, uh, and gardens uh, with the, your lawn clippings. You can have volatility from the lawn care applications or from a right-of-way application nearby uh, or just a misapplication of herbicides. But that was not explaining the symptoms we were seeing on a lot of um, in a lot of garden spaces, uh, and so our attention was really turned to you know what what appeared to be some contaminated compost, right? And this was not backyard compost that was made with lawn clippings that were contaminated. This was commercially available uh, compost. You know, and compost is a great soil amendment. It's generally, it's weed free because the composting cycle uh, kills weed seeds and, and other weed propagules. Uh, but too frequently we've run into problems where this compost has been contaminated. And here is a, uh, a garden area uh, of a, uh, a colleague of ours who is an avid gardener. And he, he had a little bit of X of leftover compost that he put on the edge of this garden. And you can see by the growth and the symptoms of these celosia where that compost was placed. The healthy plants received no compost uh, and a larger amount of compost was added to this, you know, this bed. And we, looked closely, we see that classic curling of the leaves uh, and the, the overall growth reduction, but that curling of the leaves told us that, that there was probably a synthetic auxin herbicide involved in this. And you'll see that, that curled and cupped uh, uh, leaves, um, you know, in particularly tomato is very sensitive, plants in the uh, APACE, uh, that's in the center, that's a, um, I think that was a dill plant, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and plants in the Asteraceae are often sensitive, solanaceous plants are very sensitive, but you'll see these, these twisted and curled, what we call epinastic growth, right? And, and that's, that's what happens, as Cole was describing, as the, you know, some cells just keep expanding while others are not and it just curls the plant, uh, curls the tissues over. Um, and so these are the symptoms that we were seeing. Um, and one of the other things that we noted was in really diverse plantings, not all of the species were, um, were seen to be affected. And there was variability in the, um, the severity of symptoms. Uh, and so here's another example of a garden from this year. Um, the, the squash in that, in that bed did not seem to be affected, but the tomatoes and the beans and the peas and the peppers were very uh, damaged. And um, so again, the beets, the cabbage, even some nasturtium that had been planted in the beds were not affected. So this is something that uh, I think is important for you to note is that even though these herbicides are very active, the, the contaminant in the in this compost is very active compound, very effective on lots of broadleaf weeds. When you put it in this uh, contaminated compost amended to the soil, um, there are a lot of plants that may not be symptomatic. Uh, and that actually sort of helps in the diagnostics because uh, we do know that uh, squash and beets and cabbage are a little more tolerant to trace amounts of these uh, residual auxinic uh, herbicides than are uh, beans and tomatoes and peas and peppers. So what did we do? Well, we had this pile of compost. We had the symptoms of the plants. How do you know that it's actually an herbicide and not some other 
uh, nutritional problem. And it's really based upon the symptomology, the symptoms of injury and the patterns of injury. And here's, a, here's an example of, the, um, of where we did a bioassay. It's a great first step is to take a sample of the, of the compost, mix that with some potting mix, and then grow some plants in the potting mix, and then also in the plants with the potting mix amended with your compost that you think might be, a, uh, and might be contaminated. And seed several different bioassay species. So in this image you see on the, uh, the left-hand side, we had the beans, we had some corn, we had some tomatoes that were transplanted into it, and all of those species were stunted as you can see on the right. But one of the interesting things is if we took our sample, depends on where we took the sample from the pile, okay, from the sample from the dry, from the center of this pile, which was dry, uh, we got uh, more severe symptoms than if we took the sample on the edge of the bed that had uh, been wetted by rains and was basically thinner, which provided a uh, greater opportunity for the, uh, the chemical in there to break down or wash out. So, uh, so when you do these, these bioassays, you want a sample from the center of the pile. Then it's also good to take a sample from the edge. And you may find that there's a big difference in the response. And that's, that gives you a, a actually some very good information that you can use to say, well, you know, if you just get this spread out and give it some time, that herbicide is already breaking down. Um, and so running these bioassays are a really good tool. And in fact, I've got to say when I got my uh, pile of mulch in, uh, or excuse me, my pile of compost in this spring to amend to a new garden bed. I set up my bioassay and I planted some tomato plants in that, uh, in that mix. Uh, and I waited to see what, the sim what symptoms might develop. And after about uh, you know, three weeks, uh, the plants were deep green. Uh, they did not show clear signs of, of this uh, oxen uh, herbicide injury. And I felt like, okay, well, it's safe to incorporate this compost. Well, if you'll remember what the weather was like this spring, it was cool, you know? So we had cold, cold, really cool nights. And so the tomatoes were not growing rapidly. So what I found was, in fact, I did in receive a load of compost that was contaminated, but the bioassay took more than four weeks to show the symptoms because the weather was so cool that the tomato was not growing fast enough to show the symptoms. So the, the conditions have to, be, have to be good. You may have to bring those bioassay plants inside the house and put them in a sunny window. Even better if you've got a sun porch uh, uh, where where the uh, the night temperatures are going to be warmer than outside and and uh, get those get those plants growing rapidly because if the plants aren't growing rapidly you will not see the symptoms. Uh, but auxins are not the only things that can cause a problem in uh, in gardens. Okay, there are other herbicides that are residual herbicides that are absorbed by the roots, translocate to the growing points, and and will kill and stunt plants. Um, one that I see fairly often in landscape plants now is a what we call an ALS inhibitor. Uh, uh, Imazapic is an herbicide used on, on uh, roadsides for broadleaf weed control. It's absorbed by the roots. It's also a common component in some of those extended weed control formulations you see uh, in the retail garden centers. So imagine, if you will, if you inadvertently, instead of just getting glyphosate to kill the weeds before you prepare your garden beds, if you inadvertently got one of these formulations that has a residual herbicide in it, and then you prepare your beds, 
and plant, you know, you could very easily introduce a, uh, an injury, uh, herbicide injury into your garden beds uh, in that way. So just wanted to, not gonna dwell on this one, but just wanted to highlight that synthetic auxins are not the only herbicides that can uh, cause problems. Now, we have lots of, other, lots of uh, resources that you can go to for additional information and for uh, sort of refresher of some of the things that uh, Cole and I have talked about today. Um, and here's some of those, those uh, resources. And I, I want to uh, point out a couple of them in particular, uh, Dr. Katie Jennings and um, uh, Janine Davis uh, put together this uh, fact sheet on herbicide carryover in compost and hay. Uh, this was something that's been very uh, uh, important to organic growers. Uh, some general uh, herbicide injury uh, information, in particular on what to do guidance. And, you know, I am going to stop share for just a moment so I can show you that I'm going to share that website with you just so you'll see um, at this this website you'll find uh, information on you know the symptoms of herbicide entry fact sheets and some information on what do you do if you suspect you have information you have herbicide injury and there's a nice checklist there of a lot of things that you you, you should a lot of information you should gather uh, and a few things that you, you want to avoid because it's really important in these situations to avoid jumping to conclusions, all right? It's, it's, uh, it's very easy to misdiagnose the source of a contaminant, uh, herbicide contaminant. So, uh, you know, don't jump to conclusions. Make sure you get all the facts before you draw those conclusions. There's also information on how to conduct a herbicide uh, or a bioassay for herbicide residues, um, and uh, links to the uh, to the vegetable and small fruits uh, crops uh, herbicide injury symptom uh, website, as well as some other resources. All right, I'm going back to my PowerPoint now. Okay, so there are also some resources at the U.S. Uh, Composting Council. That's the last one. Uh, they have they, the Composting Council is aware of this problem in compost, um, and uh, unfortunately, they, we really don't have good, um, really don't have good uh, uh, options uh, to to screen compost for the residual or what you can do uh, afterwards. There really is no way to remediate it. You'll see a lot of uh, blogs on the internet suggesting to incorporate uh, activated uh, charcoal or activated carbon. And while that is effective for some herbicides, it's not particularly effective for uh, uh, mitigating uh, these residual auxinic herbicides in uh, compost systems because let's face it the compost has a lot of organic matter in it already and just adding a little extra activated carbon is not going to change the concentration of the herbicide or bind up the concentration of the herbicide that much more. Um, so unfortunately once you diagnose that it is in fact contaminated compost, there is very little that one can do uh, to uh, remediate it. And the really the only sure way to remediate uh, that situation is to let Mother Nature uh, take over and start degrading the herbicide. And it will break down over time. Uh, but once it's in your, your garden soil, um, you are basically left with, um, with almost no other option than to, than to just uh, till in the, um, the plants that are in the garden and wait. And then conduct a bioassay, plant some beans, transplant some tomatoes into that soil periodically until those plants start to grow normally, and then you can uh, reestablish the garden. Okay. 
And so, again, you know, if you if you need some more information, I encourage you to go to uh, to this this site. Um, it's the uh, you can find it on on NC State's extension uh, portals just by searching for the herbicide injury fact sheets, uh, and this uh, this site would show up. But in there, if you you have to respond or think that you might have some herbicide um, contaminants, uh, make sure you look at that tab on what to do. Um, if you have, you have clients that want to conduct a bioassay, there's uh, guidelines on how to advise them to do that. Um, and there's uh, their fact sheets to lots of other resources there. So at that point, I will stop and invite any, uh, any questions. Um, this is Gina Myers, Wake County. And uh, I appreciate that presentation. I think it was spot on. Uh, it's a huge problem in this county. I probably get five or 10 photos and questions per week about this problem. And I always tell people, first of all, use, use a bioassay before you ever dump a load of compost anywhere, because I've done it twice, um, use the herbicide contaminated compost, and also, let the garden center or landscape supply company where you bought it know that the compost was contaminated just so at least they have that information i know that it's really hard for the composting companies to control this but it really is a huge problem for homeowners with vegetable gardens and they they really shouldn't be selling it to them um, so yeah it's a big issue here in our county Unfortunately, uh, Gina is right. It's, it's not just in Wake County because there are actually very few commercial compost suppliers in the region and they supply a lot of um, both wholesale and, and consumer uh, outlets. So when you're buying bulk compost, uh, it's, it is important to, uh, to run that bioassay before you plant your garden. Uh, this is uh, Jean Carlone from Durham County. Um, eating vegetables from the non-symptomatic plants, um, considered harmful, uh, any advice? Um, according to the um, information at the um, U.S. Composting Council's website, they indicate that uh, that the residues would not be an issue uh, for plants that uh, survived enough to, uh, to grow. Now, having said that, I was involved in a situation here where a community garden was contaminated. They wanted, their, their strategy was an organic garden and they were donating the produce to um, a food shelter. In that situation, my advice was not to harvest anything from that garden, to plow it all under and just plant some cover crops to, uh, to try and draw the, um, draw the herbicide out of the soil and, and just let biology break it down. Now, my reason for that uh, advice is that these particular herbicides, um, well, let me say, not all of the herbicides that might be in this compost um, and cause this problem, not all of them have a food use registration. Clopyrrolid is actually labeled for use in several food crops, uh, strawberries, um, uh, uh, the brassicas. Uh, so some of, some of the brassica crops, there are uses for clopyrrolid. So I would be not concerned if we knew that it in fact was clopyrrolid, but to find out exactly what herbicide is in there um, will cost somewhere on the order of a thousand dollars to send the sample out for analysis. So you got to ask that question, do you want to spend a thousand dollars or more testing your 
uh, your compost and finding out it whether it's clopyrrolate or not, but or do you want to just spend a thousand dollars at the um, at the farmers market and take those vegetables? Um, in this case, it, it really made more sense for this for this site to just take their their efforts and some collections and go to the farmer's market, get food, and then deliver that to the food shelters. Um, a very sad, you know, outcome there, of course. But the good news is, is they're going to be back in business by fall. These herbicides, they do persist, but once you have distributed the compost into the soil, the herbicides begin to break down more rapidly. Okay. And so typically within you know, 16 weeks, the, the herbicide has dissipated. But again, how would you know that? Just plant some beans and tomatoes in there. Yeah. And Joe, can I add that um, I have had an experience, depend, it depends on how much was in it, because I have had experiences where it took longer than that for tomatoes. You okay. can plant greens because they're not susceptible, but if you want to know if your fall crop is susceptible, you can plant peas Yes. because they will show show up. So that's a good way to check on the fall fall um, contamination levels. Excellent. Thank you, Gina. Yeah, so, so there is, I'm sorry, I can't give you a firm yes or no on that. Some of that is a personal choice. If it's your own backyard garden and, you know, you're okay with, well, it might have a trace amount of an herbicide that, you know, then, then, you know, eat it. Um, all I can say it is, you know, I have been accused on many occasions of being quite the nozzle head, but <laughs> I am not eating the, the vegetables out of the uh, garden bed where I incorporated the contaminated compost this year. You know, I'm just not going, I'm just not going to do it because I don't know what it is. You know, if I knew what it was, then I would make an informed decision. Yeah. That's a yeah. great point, Joe. Um, I wanted to follow up too on a couple of things that were in the chat that you mm -hmm. and Cole had answered um, earlier when we were talking about these herbicides that can volatize the question that come in about how far can they drift and Cole had added that it can be miles. Um, depending on the weather and the product. And then somebody had asked about, was this all products? And Joe, you had added that it was the ester formulations that are much more likely to drift. And I wanted to follow up on that and say, are there many homeowner products that have that ester formulation? Is this yes. good? At, there are a lot. There are a lot of lawn care products uh, that have the ester formulation. There are a lot of that's amazing what's available in the marketplace for homeowners to use. Quite frankly, it, I, I get surprised every time I go to the garden center and look at the aisle of, of herbicides that are available. Um, there are products in there that um, essentially, uh, uh, Cole showed the, uh, the volatile drift from crossbow applications. Uh, there are homeowner formulations of crossbow uh, that are available in many garden centers. Um, the labels give guidance such as do not apply when daytime temperatures are above 80 degrees. Well, we know from research that they will volatilize, you know, below 80 degrees. And really my guidance is don't use an ester formulation uh, if daytime temperatures are expected to be above 65 degrees for the next week. That, that's my just personal gut feeling. Was the research shows that the ester formulation is only better at cold in cold weather when temperatures are below 69 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so there's really no reason to use the ester when the weather is, is milder. Uh, the amine formulations are just as effective uh, under milder conditions. Uh, and the amine formulations really do not volatilize. We tried to make the amines volatilize for an educational program we did a few years ago at the Hort Field Lab in Raleigh. Some of you may have participated in that, where we, we put a tent over um, 
a, a grassy area that we sprayed with the amine and another area we sprayed with the um, ester formulation, a low volatile ester. And then we, we took container plants, an oak, a rose, and several other things, and placed these plants on top of that, that grass that we had sprayed and, and put a plastic tent over them uh, for, um, for a day. Then to, to basically, and this was in June, so it was hot. It was over 100 degrees in those little tents. And of course, the ester formulation, the low volatile ester, volatilized was caught in that space and we had lots of injury uh, on the trees and shrubs in that tent um, but next to it you know in the amine treated area there was no injury zero injury so we just could not get it to volatilize so advise your customers use the amine formulation as much as possible um, and uh, as Cole mentioned, the drift injury, particularly and and including the amine, uh, uh, or excuse me, the ester volatilization, is usually a very transient event. You know, right in the early spring, you get this this flush of new growth, and you get a, the ester formulation is applied, and you get this one-time sort of flush of the the vapors that are absorbed by the expanding leaves and those leaves are damaged a few growing points are damaged and then the tree regrows a few weeks later and there's no herbicide in the atmosphere to damage them that's the typical scenario but we have seen situations where the the dose in the volatility is so high that we're getting severe damage to sensitive landscape plants. Um, and that's, those are the most difficult situation to try to diagnose because it, it defies our collective knowledge of what should happen. But it's, it's definitely possible to get severe injury from these ester formulations. Yeah, I warned Cole earlier that I do tend to uh, keep talking. We appreciate it. This was wonderful and just extremely informative and timely. Um, if you guys don't mind hanging out, I think what we'll do is ask Matt to go ahead and share with us the current past. And if more questions come into the chat, would you um, be willing to, to hang out a little while and, and address those? I'll stick around. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right. And thank you, Cole. That was both of those were excellent. All right, Matt, you're up. All right. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a few things today, uh, luckily, because we're um, getting there in time, but um, just wanted to highlight a few things. I have a few interactive uh, slides uh, to talk to everyone about, but um, first I'm gonna talk about this little critter, uh, the Ligurian leafhopper. So this is a cicadelid, uh, the family of leafhoppers, and the uh, scientific name is Eupteryx decimnotata. Um, and this is a really tiny little insect that's native to the Mediterranean region. Uh, specifically around the Ligurian Sea uh, in France and Italy. Um, and it is a very small insect again, uh, about three millimeters long, and it has this distinct leopard-like pattern all over it, and it has these four dots on its head. Um, there's another similar species, um, Eupteryx melissi, that's called the sage leafhopper, and that only has three dots on its head. So I'm talking about this today because they feed specifically on mint, the mint family, um, the Lamiaceae, and this includes various mints, of course, but also lots of herbs that we'd like to plant in our gardens, um, including rosemary, oregano, and thyme. Um, and heavy, heavy feeding damage is going to cause these chlorotic spots and overall duller color. Um, and I'll show you some examples in a second. But just to get a closer look, uh, so as with all leafhoppers, they have, this is their hind leg that's actually pressed up against the body. They have these rows of spines that look like thorns running down the length. This is pretty, this is very characteristic of leafhoppers in general. 
so look out for that. Again, these are very small insects, so you have to use a hand lens. Um, again, the four dots on their head and this distinctive leopard-like patterning on it. Now, they don't leave fecal matter like some other bugs uh, because they're sucking mostly water and sugar and, uh, you know, retaining all those nutritionist, nutritional uh, products from the plant. They're only going to be ejecting sugary water, so you won't see any black fecal specks or anything like that associated with them. They are very quick. Uh, so if you find uh, plants that are being affected, you can shake them a little bit. You can see that these little tiny white insects are flittering around. Um, very tough to uh, capture. Uh, but you can definitely see the evidence of their feeding. So these you can see in this uh, time, all these little white splotches, uh, the same with the oregano, and very characteristic, very common on rosemary too where basically the insect sucks the green out of the plants. Um, as far as control, they're very difficult to control. Uh, they're very, uh, they move around a lot. Uh, you can maybe use some yellow sticky cards in certain areas to catch some of the adults. Um, some of the young that stay on the plant more and aren't, uh, don't have wings and can't fly, maybe using some of the uh, um, soaps or horticultural oils, but otherwise, uh, they are fairly difficult to control otherwise. So uh, just be on the lookout, um, you know, uh, try to uh, disrupt them. You can catch them. You can, I don't know, it's, uh, they're just difficult to control. But note that if you are seeing this damage on uh, mints, that that's likely from leafhoppers, specifically this species. Okay, I want to do a little critter or not session today. Um, and uh, for those of you who have not been involved in this, so this is where we show you some things. And if you think it's a critter, an insect, mite, spider, mollusk, or vertebrate animal, or a product of those things, uh, click on A. If you think it's an infection, a disease, or pathogen, B. Uh, if you think this is a free living fungus, abiotic problem, man made issue, or something else, uh, click C, please. And if you want to keep track of your score, that's great. If not, just have fun and play along. Um, so first one, critter or not, this is on a holly from Union County. Um, and we got this in earlier. Let's see if I can, whoop, oh, oh no. Where's my poles? All right, well, I, I'm gonna- I've launched, I've launched oh, that great. for you, Matt. Thanks, Charlotte. <laughs> All right, so let's start this, critter or not. So we'll give it about 30 seconds. I've got a few of these and I always like to get everybody's interactions and keep people on their toes. So A was critter, B was infection, like a pathogen, mm -hmm. and C was, was, what was C? Something else that's, you know, a free living else. fungus or something else, you know, it could be a man-made object. It could just be a natural plant object, something like that. Okay. All right. I'm going to end the poll now um, and I'm going to share the results. Okay. A lot of people answered A, uh, some kind of critter. Uh, some people answered B and a few people answered C. So this is an interesting one. Um, close this up. So this actually was C. It's not a critter. Uh, it's actually apparently got the common name insect egg slime, but this is a slime mold. You can see here's, a, here's another picture of a different one. They do have variation in color, but slime molds will often crawl. You can see how it's crawling on all of these other parts of the plant before uh, sporulating or whatever it's called. Michael probably uh, correct me, but uh, slime molds are very weird um, organisms, they're not true fungi, they are, they have an active stage and they often get all over plants that they're not affecting, but they're just sites for them to attach and to develop further. Okay. Okay, this is on Lantana. Is this a critter or not? Is this a critter? Is this a disease? Is this uh, something else? So, Charlotte, if you don't mind launching the poll so I don't mess it all up. All right, we'll give everybody about 30 seconds. OK, 
Okay, we've got a lot of people participating. That's nice. All right. All right, we're going to end that there and we're going to share the results. So, um, about 60% 60 60 of people said A, it is a critter. Uh, about 28% of people said B, it's a disease. And C, about 12% of people said it is. Um, it is something else. Okay, so this is the one that you should definitely be on the lookout for. This is actually the wax left behind from baby flatted plant hopper nymphs. Uh, these nymphs will not harm plants. Uh, they're very common. This one is actually was on a blackberry, uh, but they like to suck some of the sap, but they don't really cause issues. Um, so it's good, it's fine to leave them alone. If you really can't stand that wax on there, you can wipe it down. Um, or wait till it leaves, like the one in the previous photo. This is an old one where the, the, uh, the plant hopper is probably either matured or moved to a different part of the plant. But again, they usually have this very characteristic circular form with very loose, waxy substance. Um, and this is what the adults are going to turn into. These just plant hoppers, again, they're not pests. They're very common out in the environment uh, and kind of cute, I think. So, uh, you know, no need to worry about them. Okay, what about this, critter or not? This is on uh, Chinese elm. You can see all over, it's got the, whoop, shoot. Light touchpad there. Okay, so we've got. The yeah. answer selection just changed tremendously. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I know, I should uh, my, I uh, tried to just use the arrow and that my finger slipped, so. Could you repeat what the A, B, C, Ds are? Sure. A is actually a critter, some kind of insect or insect damage or, or arthropod or animal damage. Uh, B is a disease, so some kind of plant pathogen. And C is going to be something else. It's uh, either an abiotic issue or it's a free living organism or something that's not causing damage or disease. So, okay, well, we're going to stop the poll there. Uh, we've got a lot of people saying C, 51%, uh, but also some people saying B, a disease. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is, it's good for the people in the majority and C that said it, but it is a difficult one. This is one of those ones that a lot of people miss ID for diseases, but these are actually the lenticels, the natural breathing structures on the bark and the trunk of this tree. So because we know it's Chinese elm, we know that that's a fairly uh, common, that's a common characteristic of these uh, trees. And a lot of things, uh, a lot of trees have lenticels. For instance, the white ones on cherries uh, and other prunus species, uh, lots of trees have them, but there are similar fungi that will burst out of the, uh, out of infected branches and, and trunks and look orangish. So it is good to know the host in these situations, to know what is normal. Okay, last one, critter or not? I'm not gonna touch my mouse. You can all see it. Well, uh, let's see, is this critter or not? Is this something this is on the bottom of a uh, potted plant pot. Um, okay, just coming about up to the end. All right, we'll end this poll. So uh, majority of people said it's a critter. Uh, some people said it looks like a disease and other people say it's some kind of free living thing. Now I could definitely see how this might look like some other kind of slime mold or something like that. But actually this is a spider egg sac. This is a type of spider egg sac. Um, and actually I wanted to just talk about these very briefly because I've actually been seeing a lot of uh, these spiders this year. Um, and the spiders that make this type of egg sac are called ground sac spiders. Um, so these are in the family, either in the family Corinidae, which also contains some ant mimicking species, and this family called Furo Furolithidae, say that 10 times fast, which are now called the guardstone spiders. This actually right here, this Furo tempus was used to be in the Corinidae, but now is in its own family with some other, other spiders. 
So these are variable in color. Some are brown, but others are very brightly colored or even metallic. And actually, Fruer tempus is known for its metallic scales on its abdomen and in uh, some species, these big kind of leg warmers on it. They are very fast, active spiders and, very, and appear very nervous and erratic. Um, I actually saw several in my house a few weeks ago. I think the rains have been pushing them around uh, the environment. Uh, I've also seen them on my house when doing yard work and they're kind of hunting around really nervously looking for prey. They may enter homes, like I said, but are harmless. Um, and just to get another idea of how pretty they are, this is a close-up of another Fruer tempus specimen I took in Schenck Forest here in, in Raleigh. And you can see that band, you know, these scales when the light shines on it a certain way, you should give this golden or purple uh, iridescent pattern. Now, uh, true carinids uh, in, the, uh, in the family Carinidae, uh, the one main genus that we often see is this one, Castionera, which very really crazy looking spiders. Uh, they can be tiger striped. Um, there's even one species around that's orange with tiger stripes, so it looks like a mini tiger, uh, but almost like a cartoon spider. Um, and one of the ones that I get a lot of are these, uh, there's a few species that have a red patch on their abdomen. Sometimes they're completely black with a very large red patch. And I get a lot of questions from people asking if they are red back spiders from Australia which is really just the black widow of Australia. Um, and they're very different. These spiders are on the ground moving quickly. They're hunting, they don't live in webs, but uh, just know, be aware that there are spiders that are all black with a red back around, but they're gonna be on the ground looking for prey and not a web building spider like, brown, uh, but like widow spiders. There was a question in the chat about how large they get. They are not very large. They, they are about a half an inch with their legs, maybe three quarters of an inch with their legs. Uh, they're, not, they're not a huge spider, but they are very thin-legged and erratic. Uh, that's usually the best way you can tell. They're usually dark colored. Um, so, and there are a number of, of types of spiders called ground spiders or sack spiders that are very similar looking. They used to actually all be grouped into one group, but now we've been finding more differences and they're being split up more. And just real, Really quickly, here's a close-up um, by Katja Schultz of one of those egg sacs. This is actually one of the fruitipids, uh, the or the fruitolithids, where it's red. But the carinids, like the Castionera, are going to have also similar-looking disc-shaped, very flat and shiny, but they're typically more tan or cream-colored. Um, and you can actually see the little outlines of the eggs right here. So if you see these around, they're just spiders, they're harmless, they're not, you know, they're out there feeding on things. So, so no need to crush or kill them or anything like that. All right, what is that? I just wanted to present this. I've been seeing a lot of these and it's just so freaky looking uh, and I love them. Uh, but this is some weird thing. It almost looks like uh, Albert, Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein's hair. Um, but this is actually a type of moth. Here you can see it on a leaf. And uh, the really cool looking, I don't know if those make it look more like a bird dropping or what, but a uh, very interesting looking little moth. And I wanna talk about these very briefly today. Um, so my question is, and if uh, this is a close up of that moth on some white paper. So my question is, what do the larvae of this moth feed on? And Charlotte, I think you have that pole. So. Okay, so is it orchids, is it toads, is it spider webs, is it fungi, or is it grasses? Okay, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, we'll end the poll there. All right, well, there you go. So most people, 51% of people said fungi. Some people said grasses, spiderwebs, and orchids. Uh, well, that is very good. So these, this moth, the larvae actually feed on bracket fungi. So it's a really weird moth. Uh, and actually the name Acrolophus mycetophagus means fungus feeder. 
And the really most, one of my, the most interesting things I think about this is this species, even though it's crazy looking um, and not so uncommon, I've seen a lot of my house lately, um, they, it was not described until 1990. So it is a relatively recently described species. So, but very cool, um, really interesting group. And you're gonna see these around a lot. There's, this is called the tubeworm tube moths. They're either in the family Tineidae or the family Acrolophidae, depending on who you talk to. And the species are all in the genus Acrolophus. Now the Tineidae are the, the clothes moths. So they're related to clothes moths, but they live outside. And they typically feed on detritus among grass roots and tubes as larvae. Uh, they sometimes feed on rotting vegetable matter, but also on fungus as we just saw. And they actually described a species that feeds in gopher tortoise burrows where they live on the fecal matter and dried plant material. They can be common at lights and they typically have this fuzzy, I kind of, they almost look like Ewoks, like from the Star Wars movies. Uh, they very brown and fuzzy. Um, and here's a couple more examples of what you may find at lights uh, very commonly right now. Uh, so they'll be out there um, very small. They've got this kind of expanded hind margin, hind wings uh, at the tip of their body and they hold their wings roof-like over their abdomen. Okay, so that's all I wanna talk about specifically as far as insects today. Um, but I did wanna get your input on a couple things before I go into bolos. Uh, at least this one thing. Uh, so have you seen the periodical cicadas? Um, I'm just curious where people are seeing them. So this is now your time if you wanna use a stamp on the annotate and just stamp where you are and uh, let us know if you've seen any of the black with orange and red eyed cicadas around. I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds if people are able to do that. And while I, uh, let's see, while this is going, while people are doing that, I don't know if anybody is doing it. Um, well, let me see if there's some, uh, what some questions are. Um, what does a chigger look like? Um, oh, how big do they get? The moths, I'm assuming. So uh, the moths are fairly small. They're gonna be about, a uh, quarter inch to a half an inch long, um, maybe a little bit bigger, um, but, but if that's what you're talking about, the, the moths. Um, what does a chigger look like? Well, chiggers are very rarely seen. They're very tiny larvae of a uh, type of mite. Uh, and by the time you uh, actually have the bite or the, the actual uh, red mark, the chigger is long gone usually by then. It's rare to actually catch them in the act. So we really don't see them very often. So it's hard to describe what they look like. Um, okay, I've got some, I've seen the sugar still attached, very small reddish. It's hard to say, that could be actually a seed tick if it's attached still. But I have been, a colleague of mine did collect a chigger off of uh, the skin and it was in fact a chigger. But for the most part, it's probably larval ticks right now or nymphal ticks. Okay. Well, I am going to move on from there. So I see a few uh, few counties, especially uh, up in the Northwest have been seeing these cicadas. Uh, that's actually where we'd expect to see them, but I was just curious about this. So uh, anyway, we'll just move on to the last thing, the bolos, so be on lookouts. So um, and I will clear this annotation. Okay, so uh, things to be on the lookout for. Um, we, we're gonna start seeing the, the annual cicadas now. So this is one that's been freshly molted. It just uh, shed its nymphal skin after climbing up from the ground to the trees. So you're gonna start hearing them. And of course, with the cicadas, uh, there, you're gonna start seeing also uh, the cicada killers. Now, as I mentioned last time, there's been a lot of fear about uh, Asian giant hornets or what people have been calling murder hornets. Uh, in fact, I just got this morning two images of cicada killers, one being thought of as being a, an Asian giant hornet. So this is with the time of year. Be careful. Don't kill all these large wasps that you see, because oftentimes now they're going to be these large cicada killers, which are native wasps 
They are not going to harm anybody. They're not aggressive. Uh, and the best way to tell them from Asian giant hornets are they've got very, very large eyes with no notch in the eye. Uh, Asian giant hornets will have very small eyes and a completely yellow head with a notch in the eye. And also cicada killers have these orange legs with this pointed black abdomen with a few pale yellow markings near the base. Uh, they do get as large or even bigger than Asian giant hornets, but that's because they need to grab their cicada prey and bring it for their young. Okay, so be on the lookout. Don't worry about them digging in the ground. They're going to be around for a few months and then they'll be gone. Um, and they really only like prefer bare soil with a lot with a, not a lot of vegetation where they nest. And they'll nest in groups, but they don't actually form a colony, so they're not going to be aggressive. You're going to be seeing a lot of full-grown wheel bugs now. Uh, these are very large grayish-brown uh, assassin bugs with this big cog on the back. These are uh, important predators, but also note, do not grab them, do not hold them. They can deliver a very painful bite with that long hypodermic needle type mouth part. You also start seeing fall webworms in the tips of the branches, uh, creating webs, uh, these tents. Uh, to control them, the best thing to do is to clip out those branches or treat nearby vegetation that they're feeding on. Uh, but uh, basically, you can also rip them open and allow other hunting wasps and parasitoids to come in and kill them. Of course, there's other caterpillars uh, that are going to be around uh, in the garden. You're going to have a lot of the hornworms are going to be there. You're going to have some army worms, maybe. Uh, on your brassicans, you're going to have cross-striped cabbage worms, also uh, uh, cabbage whites and diamondback moths. In your um, uh, cucurbits, you're gonna have squash vine borer. If you see uh, wet um, frass and uh, holes in the base of the stem, you may be able to slice open the stem, kill the larva and bury that stem more to, to help your plants, but otherwise they can kill the plants outright. And lots of other critters are just gonna start to get bigger now. It's becoming summer. It's uh, going to start to be the time of year where they're bulking up and they're starting to breed. Uh, so you're going to see things like larger and start to notice things like uh, garden, uh, black and yellow garden spiders, also larger praying mantises, and like I said, the wheel bugs, things that have up until now have been very, very small are going to start to get much bigger. And with that, I am done with my part and uh, I'll hand it back over to Charlotte and answer some questions if I need to. All right, thank you, Matt. I um, also wanted to mention that Joe and Cole have been answering some questions in the chat too. So if you had posted a question from the herbicide section, just scroll through the chat and see if they've added that answer. Um, you can save the chat as well. When, you, when you're in the chat, you should see um, a little box with three dots on, at the bottom on the right side. And if you click on that, um, the first option says save chat. So if you wanted to save it um, for all of the links that have been added, as well as just for the question and answer that's been going on, you, you can um, save it that way. All right, we're gonna finish up with our plant of the month and weed of the month. And our plant of the month this month is blueberry, which most of us think of as um, a fruit plant and we're growing it to harvest the fruit. But let's forget its value as a wildlife plant and a landscape plant. It is a beautiful plant um, in the landscape and many things uh, rely on it. Um, pollinators from bees to butterflies, birds eat the fruit, which of course is often an, a pest issue for us if we're, tr we're trying to grow it to eat the fruit. But if you turn it around and just look at it as a wildlife plant, then that's no longer an issue for you. <laughs> um, we do have 17 species at least of uh, blueberries native to North Carolina and they range from really low growing to you know quite tall um, multi-stemmed almost tree form ones. So the most common one we see grown in home landscapes is the rabbit eye blueberry, which is Vaccinium virgatum, used to be Vaccinium ashii, and um, it's the, the more resilient one as far as fruit production. Um, in commercial production, we often see the high bush blueberry, um, but that one is much more sensitive to soil conditions and um, for homeowners, the rabbit eye for fruit production is generally the best choice. 
And um, so if we look at it and think about rabbit eye blueberries beyond just a fruit producing plant, um, we find many different types of bees do pollinate them. There's even an Eastern blueberry bee that relies on our, our native blueberries for um, survival. Um, this is just a bumblebee in the picture. Um, we have different butterflies that feed on them and we have quite a range of caterpillars, including the unicorn caterpillar and who wouldn't want unicorn caterpillars in their garden. And of course birds then feed on the caterpillars as well as on the berries of blueberries. Um, the flowers come out early in, in March and April. The fruit are ripening now, just started in my garden. Um, there's a lot of cultivars, so the, you can have early varieties which are starting to ripen now, and they keep going usually typically through August. And then from a landscape uh, feature, the fall color on blueberries is some of the best you can get in the south. And if they're typically a little late to color up, November, December, um, so they can just be stunning at that time of the year for fall color. Rabbit eye blueberries are pretty tall, so make sure that um, you plant them somewhere, you give them plenty of space. They will grow in sun or part shade. They're one of the few fruits that will produce in part shade. And even though they're more resilient than the high bush types, they still do need that well-drained, moisture retentive, and most importantly, acidic soil. So we're looking for a pH of four to 5.5 which is lower than even things like camellia and azalea like. So we're talking about pretty low pH. You can achieve that by adding organic matter to the soil, such as ground pine bark. Um, if your pH is high, you can add products containing sulfur to lower it, but do not ever put lime because lime is going to raise pH. Um, there's some links here, which I'll drop into the chat where you can learn more if you want to know about growing blueberries for fruit production. Um, we have our blueberry portal. If you want to know more about the pollinators of blueberries, there's a great post, um, extension post. And then you can go back to our, two our August 2018 Plants, Pests, and Pathogens when Bill Klein was our guest speaker and shared all about growing blueberries in home gardens, including um, pruning, pruning of them, which is an important part. Um, I wanted to hit just a few of the less common blueberries. These are ones we don't grow for fruit so much. They do produce an edible they're small. So these would be ones you probably, if you look around, could find growing at the edge of the woods or different natural areas. Um, we don't see them in landscapes so much, but they are very nice plants and, you know, are something that are deserve to be added more to our landscapes, especially when we're thinking of increasing um, the wildlife value. So Mayberry is one of the earliest blooming and earliest fruiting. I don't have a picture of it. It looks a little bit like this top picture. It has a smaller leaf, a real shiny leaf, um, but it's very tough and adaptable. And it's one that's relatively tall um, and occurs naturally mostly in the Eastern half of North Carolina. Then we have a couple of different species that are commonly called low bush blueberries, um, like Vaccinium tenellum, which is more the east and central North Carolina, and then Vaccinium pallidum, which is in the west and central North Carolina. They look relatively similar. They, they have this low growing habit, about two feet, and they're rhizomatous, so they spread. So it'd be something if you wanted to have a, a shrubby ground cover um, or an understory, that would be an interesting thing to add and you'd get the fall color and you'd get the spring flowers and the fruit and all these interesting things visiting um, the plants. And then for something really low, low growing, there is the creeping blueberry, which um, is native to Eastern North Carolina. And um, it truly does only grow, you know, maybe about six inches and is evergreen. There, is a, there are a couple of cultivars. Wells Delight is the one in the picture. They do require well-drained soil. Um, that's pretty essential, but I've had luck with it here in my Piedmont garden, just in an area that, that had pretty good drainage. These are going to be a little more difficult to find um, than some of the plants we've talked about as for our plant of the month, but they are pretty um, easy to find in the wild. So you could even collect the berries, the seed, and clean them separate the seed out from the berry, the fleshy berry, and grow them from seed, or take cuttings. And this is the right time of the year to take cuttings. So if you have some native blueberries growing around um, that you've been admiring, um, this would be a great time to try to propagate a few from some cuttings of that new growth. Um, just put them in a container with potting mix, wrap it up in a plastic bag. Um, a, a rooting hormone will help, but put them in the shade. You don't want them to, to cook out in the sun with a plastic bag around there container. 
You can learn more about these species in the Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. And we'll finish up with our weed of the month. And um, our weed of the month is one that can trick you a little bit. Um, so just looking at the picture here, would you think, and you can put this in the chat, would you think this was a grass, a sedge, or a broadleaf type of weed? Just when we're trying to identify weeds, that's usually the first, one of the first questions we ask. Is it a grass, is it a sedge, or is it a broadleaf? We got, we got some folks I think who know what this is. They're putting grass. We've got some folks coming back with broadleaf. Yeah, we've got some folks who know what it is. Yeah. Good. So yeah, so we've got we've got a mix of grass and broadleaf, which um, if you're familiar with this plant, you and I see some people are you're recognizing it. But if you're not and you saw it, it would be very easy to think this is a broadleaf plant, but it is actually a grass. Um, it is Japanese stilt grass, which is one of these warm season annual grasses. It is invasive in North Carolina and much of the eastern United States. Um, it is uh, Microstegium viminium. It comes up in the late winter, early spring, and grows upright or, or in more shade. It can be very sprawly, up to about three feet. Where it touches the ground, it'll root at the node, so it just kind of makes this thicket. Um, it does adapt to mowing, so if it's in your lawn and you mow it, it'll stay really short. Um, when you see it growing individually like this, it does somewhat resemble a little miniature bamboo plant. Unlike a lot of grasses, the blade is relatively wide compared to the length of the blade, um, but still the blade is much longer than it is wide. Um, the, like, like with other grasses, the leaf blades are alternate on the stem. And you will find it this time of year, especially in shady, moist places. It can be in lawns, it can be in landscapes, um, and it can be a real problem in, in natural and woodland areas. There is a great field guide to ID um, from Alabama Extension and some other partners. Um, I'll drop that in the chat in a minute. And there's also a plant toolbox profile for Japanese stilt grass. This is just what you would see it like quite often in natural areas. It's just, it's just green. It just covers everything. And then management, we do have, in fact, Joe Neal, um, lead author on our fact sheet on Japanese stilt grass ID and management. Um, since it is a warm season annual, we're really targeting that management at um, stopping seed from being produced. And especially with Japanese stilt grass, um, research has shown the seed remain viable less than seven years. So as a long-term management, if you can do anything to prevent new plants from producing seed so that you're just depleting the seed reservoir in the soil um, is how you have a, a long-term management of that. And two ways are using some type of pre-emergent herbicide, especially in a landscape bed or a turf area. Um, the, the products that will work on crabgrass work quite well on um, Japanese stiltgrass. You just have to get them out early enough because this will germinate before crabgrass. And then after it germinates, we want to stop it from making seed. Luckily, it doesn't make seed till later in the fall late, or, or, or late summer, early fall, so September, October. So if you've got it in just a few areas you can hand weed before those seeds start to set, that's great. If you've got it in areas that you can manage with herbicides um, and get it before the seeds are starting to be produced. And even mowing, um, mowing in late summer, like in August, can uh, reduce seed set a lot. Um, so these, these and the products that are listed here are all included in the Japanese stiltgrass ID and management fact sheet. So you can get um, more specific um, recommendations there. All right, I want this to um, just remind everybody to stay up to date on all of our announcements. Um, we now have our email list as a Google group. Um, so if you're not already a member, you can subscribe um, and get all of our announcements. And I'm gonna put those links in the chat box right now related to the plant and weed of the month. And when you sign up for our Google group, um, just make sure you get a confirmation email. It might go to your spam. And I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. All right. 
and um, encourage everybody to join us next month, July 28th, when we will be talking more about weeds. Um, in fact, Kira Sims will be our guest speaker. Kira was um, the extension agent in Davidson County. She's now um, a, a doctoral student at the Department of Horticulture and she, her research is focusing on weed management. And she's gonna tell us about weed management in the garden with a focus on understanding the tools in the toolbox. Um, so thank you all. We'll hang around for a few minutes um, for questions, but um, you can find the links in the chat um, for the Google group sign up and to find the plants, pests and pathogen playlist where you can go and review all of our past um, sessions. The recordings are available. I see we had one question about saving the chat and that um, you should find at the bottom of the chat on the right side, um, three little dots. And if you click on those three dots, there should be an option there to save chat. All right. Any other questions that we have before we close out for the day? I want to definitely say thank you to Joe Neal and Cole Smith for joining us. Of course, Matt and Mike always do a fantastic job. I'm sure I will go out this afternoon and find one of those ground sack spider egg cases. I've never seen one, but it seems like what often happens is I see it here on plants, pests, and pathogens and go out within the next day or two, I end up finding what was talked about. So I'm gonna be looking out mm -hmm. for one of those. They're, they're very common actually. It's, it's, it's actually funny though, because I don't have many photos of them because they're so common. I have never taken many photos, so I will be <laughs> sure to do that now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Joe. Everyone else. All right. I was just trying to get to our music, <laughs> to play our music to close us out. You may have seen me try to open that. So here I go. I've got it. All right. Thank you all. Bye. All right. Thank you, Joe. All right, we will see everybody next month.